Thanks. So one of the things I hear a lot when I um, talk to people here at the conference or when I talk to founders or investors is how difficult it is to scale a European business globally and even how difficult it is to scale a European business in Europe and become sort of the European leader of what you do. So what I wanted to do today is to share uh, our story at Black Black Car and how we expanded from being a French marketplace to becoming a European marketplace and what we've learned along the way, the mistakes we've made, and, um, and essentially what we've learned. So uh, what is Black Black Car? Uh, so essentially, if you think of a driver today driving a car between, let's say, Paris and Brussels in Europe, so Paris-Brussels would be about 200 miles. The real cost of driving those 200 miles between Paris and Brussels would be something like 90 euro, right? So that's the price of the petrol you put into your car, that's the insurance you pay for your car, that's the depreciation of your car, that's all the taxes you pay, maybe toll roads. So all that stuff is actually costing 90 euro to drive from Paris to Brussels, which is 200 miles. Now, if you think of something else, if you think of the empty seats you carry in your car when you do that, what's the value of an empty seat between Paris and Brussels? If you look around, if you look on the, on the train website, you'll find that an empty seat between Paris and Brussels is actually worth something between 60 euro and 100 and something euro. So it's worth a lot. So essentially what we've done with Black Black Car is we've built that marketplace so that driver could offer the empty seats to passengers going the same way. And by doing that, we created this transport network uh, based on empty seats in cars. And if you think of it, as you do that, you not only built a massive transport network, because you have so many of these empty seats driving around, but you also built a very low cost, sustainable, efficient, and in a way sort of self-organizing transport network. Now, the reality is when we started, uh, people thought of that as being something else. And they thought like, hold on. You guys are just building a niche hiking website. And that's not very sexy, and that's maybe not a very, very good business idea. And in a way, uh, it was for pretty good reasons, because you know, if you think of the typical guys you would find hitchhiking back in the days, you would end up with hippies and these kind of guys. So people thought we were building sort of a, a pretty poor experience website, a pretty poor experience product. And they also thought of um, Jack, the Hacks murderer. So they thought that the service was, was, you know, not only would be not very fun, not very pleasant, it would also be not very safe. So in a way, in the, in the early days, and before thinking about like, going European and expanding, uh, we had to work pretty hard on the solution, the product, the service. And we sort of cracked the problem, and we addressed all the issues by allowing drivers to pre-plan their trip, uh, by creating social profile so that you know who you're going to travel with, so you have information about the driver and the passenger you're going to share a ride with. Uh, we allowed passengers to actually pay for those seats, just like they would book a train ticket. And we also worked a lot on trust. And essentially, we've built trust by verifying phone numbers, verifying bank accounts, verifying credit cards, and also allowing peer reviews between drivers and passengers. So in a way, we solved most of the early problems and uh, you know, today the, the community is, uh, is pretty large in Europe, so it's not here yet in the, in the Nordics, but it's pretty much anywhere in Europe. And today we have over 5 million people sharing rides all over Europe. And today we transport actually more people on Black Black Car than the Eurostar between London, Paris and Brussels. Yet we still had one more problem. So what we wanted to build was this transport network, this ride sharing service all over Europe. And what I found pretty quickly is that we are a very local marketplace. And what I mean by that is our drivers and passengers tend to only do domestic travel. So they only stay for us in France, where we started. And I found it pretty hard at the beginning to think, like, how do we expand that? How do we go to other countries knowing that whatever we do on the product, whatever we do on the product uh, and the service is actually only, uh, only going to apply to the French market? And I looked around and I looked at what other companies have done. And when you look at marketplaces in Europe, and Nordics might be the exception actually being very successful at scaling, most marketplaces in Europe don't scale that much. They tend to stay in their home country and they struggle to go uh, to neighboring countries. So I looked at that. I looked at these companies. I also looked at US and Nordic companies and how they expanded uh, your companies like Spotify that we're going to see pretty soon, how they expanded all over Europe. 
And I came up with my own sort of dummies guide, and, and I found like three things actually that you know, these companies have done very well. And we tried to apply that to BlaBlaCar to scale the service all over Europe. So th the first thing that most of these companies do, and that we, we try to apply early on, was expanding your geographical footprint very early in the life of the company. And what I mean by that is, if you stay in your home country for too long, being a German company or a French company or a UK-based company, what's going to happen is very quickly, especially if you're a local marketplace, competitors are going to mushroom everywhere. And very quickly, you'll have same-sized competitors all over Europe, and you'll be stuck in your home country. And that's what happened to lots of marketplaces in, uh, in Europe, and they end up being subscaled compared to the US companies. So to give you a sense of how fast we, we tried to expand, and I wish we could have done faster, uh, we started the company pretty much in 2009, so that was the, uh, the commercial start of the company. And at that time, we had one employee, one market, uh, which was France. And at that time, the, the business model was completely unproven. So nothing was monetized, and we had no revenue. Uh, a year later, we expanded into Spain before even making a revenue. A year later, we expanded into the UK, and we just started to monetize the marketplace. So we just started to take a fee between the passengers and the drivers. Uh, then in 2012, things accelerated, and we raised $10 million from Accel partners. And we acquired a company in Italy, acquired a company in Poland, and then accelerated even more in 2013. And by the end of the year, we should uh, launch Russia and Ukraine. So the key here is, you know, essentially, we've built that very, very early on, you know, before the business model was proven, uh, before we got funding even. Uh, and today, we're building this marketplace all over Europe and pretty soon in, uh, in Russia. Now, the, the second learning for me was, as you do that, I don't mean localizing your website. So I don't mean just translating your website into Spanish, Italian, or German. Actually, I mean creating local teams. So what we've done very quickly uh, in the last few years uh, is we've built local teams. So we, today, we have seven local teams. So even though we are a pretty small company in many ways, uh, we operate like a multinational in the sense that we have an office in Germany, in the UK, Spain, Italy, and so on and so on. And while you might think it's a bit crazy because you know, it's complex from a legal point of view, you need to create structures and you need to create subsidiaries. Uh, it's complex from a management point of view because you end up managing like seven different offices uh, at a pretty early stage in your, uh, in your life as a startup. I actually found that to be super critical because, or, or even a necessity for us, because essentially what you end up doing is you end up creating startups within a startup. And the key for me was creating autonomy. So the German team, the, the British team, the Polish team actually work in a pretty autonomous fashion. And you know, thanks to that and by the fact that we acquired companies or we acquired hired teams, uh, we have lots of entrepreneurs in the team. And, and that's the way we've been able to sort of create and mushroom these marketplaces in different countries in parallel. Now, the third thing and last point is, as you do that, you need to be careful, though, because then you can end up with like a very sort of dismantled company, where essentially you have seven local offices, and then you don't control your brand, you don't control your communication anymore, you don't control your marketing. So one of the key things was, for us was managing that expansion and those local offices while creating a very unified brand and culture within the company. And in a way, that's something we started pretty wrong, uh, because we started with uh, a brand name that was covoiturage.fr, which means ridesharing.com in French. So in a way, because it's descriptive, it's a pretty powerful initial brand at the beginning, because it's good for SEO, and people understand what it means, and they understand what you do. Um, but very quickly, you cannot expand with it, and it's a pretty weak brand. So then we went into Spain, and in Spain we had another name called Comuto, and then we went into the UK, and it became a nightmare, because you know, we, we would have had like three different brands in three different countries. So we decided to rebrand the company Blah Blah Car. And people still ask me today, like, you know, why the hell did you call the company Blah Blah Car? You know, what's, what's wrong with you? Were you guys drunk? So we were not. And, and the key of this name and the key learning was was actually there is a story, and there is a product and a user story behind the name. So when you join Blah Blah Car and you describe your user profile, we ask you for a picture, a Facebook connect, all kind of stuff. And we ask you like how much you talk in a car. And essentially, you have this chattiness index uh, that we ask people to, to feel when they come in 
to know if they talk a lot and they're going to be blah, 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 or if they don't want to talk in a car and then they blah. And all the users actually relate to that and find that pretty funky. And in a way, it makes a story behind the brand. And it amplified our word of mouth because you know, the brand was pretty unique, pretty memorable, and people tell the story because as they start using the product, they understand why um, the brand is called Blah Blah Car. And just another quick story on that about memorable brands. I was, on the, um, I was doing an interview at the BBC in the UK a few months ago, and, um, and you know, you're not supposed to mention your brand actually on the BBC, they just don't like that. So I was waiting for the call to go live and to go live on radio, and the, the lady from the BBC was telling me, you know, you cannot mention the brand. You know, it's really on the BBC, you cannot mention your brand. And then I went live, uh, and the journalist started like, hey, we have Nicholas from Blah Blah Car. Uh, Nicholas, tell us about that name, Blah Blah Car. And we ended up talking about the brand like 20 times in two minutes. So it's free marketing in a way, right? So, so that was quite funny, and the, the funkiness of the name actually saved us probably like millions of dollars in, um, in marketing and communication today. The, the other key thing was beyond the brand was creating like a, a common culture uh, within the company. So we call everything blah blah something, by the way. So, so what we do to manage all these offices and the fact that we are a pretty young, not super organized company and we have seven offices is uh, we created uh, different things. Like for example, we have like a, a conference call, a video conference call with all the, all the offices every week where a team is going to describe what they do. So it could be like the marketing team, the Spanish team, the Italian team. And this way, all the offices communicate and all the company communicates every week, actually, for half an hour. So again, it's a lot of organization, but it's really worth it. Uh, we do something we call the blah, blah swap, where we allow any employee to go and work in a different office for one week every year. So for example, if you're a developer in France, you can go and work in Spain for a week. And same thing, by doing that, you expose your employees to you know, all the different culture and the different marketplaces. And then when they come back, they understand that they're not only building a product for their own market, they're building a product for all these different marketplaces in all these different countries. And, uh, and we also actually bring the entire team uh, back to the headquarter in Paris every six weeks. So again, it's pretty costly, but I found that to be uh, you know, a no-brainer essentially because you synchronize all your teams every week and then they go back to the local offices with all the best practices. So basically it's three things. It's you know, expand your geographical, geographical footprint very early on by doing local teams and we, having a unified brand and culture. And you know, for us that, um, that worked pretty well. So to give you a sense of, um, of growth and data, so I've shown this graph of uh, the size of the community going up to 5 million people pretty rapidly. Uh, what's interesting is to see what's behind that and what's behind that growth. So what I'm going to show you, show you now actually is the, all the new members joining the service every month per country and how the fact that we managed to become international is accelerating our growth. So that blue curve is actually all the new members joining the service in France. So it's not the size of the community, it's new people joining every month. So it can go up and down. And you know, we started to go international pretty much when we got the funding from Accel uh, in, uh, in January 2012. Uh, and then you can see all these other marketplaces uh, in Spain, in the UK, in Italy, in Poland, in Germany kicking in. So essentially we're getting to the point where within two years by creating all these local teams and local offices and sort of unified culture, today we have two thirds of our growth outside of your market. And, you know, and we manage that in about two years. So that's pretty much it for me. Uh, I was supposed to do 13 minutes. I think I'm just on time, so thanks.